What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 42, to deliver a ton of insight about scaling out your Amazon business, regardless of where you are in journey, whether you're just getting started, you're already operating a five, six, seven, or either eight-figure business. It doesn't matter. We've supported entrepreneurs who sell on Amazon at all levels, and we're here to support you, so we're super excited. Um, this is Sunday Sessions. This is a live call I do. Um, as frequently as possible on Sundays to provide tons of information and value to the community of Amazon sellers um, so we can ensure that your businesses are consistently growing month over month, week over week, and year over year. That's the name of the game, right? Financial freedom at its finest, my friends. So super excited to be here. We're going to get right into it. Any questions you have, please let them rip. It's the time. There's no dumb questions. The only dumb question is the one you do not ask. Monica, hello. Shamari, what's up? Morning. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Um, will your business offer offer distribution services? So for many years, we did offer distribution services. Um, we've since closed them only because we we're in the process of moving to a new space. I mean, we are looking to open it in the next couple months. And when we do open it, it will only be available to our inner circle members. What things do brands need to do if they would like us to exclusively sell their products on Amazon? Uh, so step one would be brand registry. It's very simple to do brand registry. You simply need a trademark from the brand. You submit the trademark to brand registry. Brand registry sends that email to the lawyer who trademarked the company. The lawyer who trademarked the company sends a code to the brand. The brand shares a code with you. You are now effectively enrolled in brand registry, which allows you to control the listing, add videos, update the images, be more consistent with the listing data, as well as run advanced advertising and have more capabilities to remove sellers who are potentially navigate or either selling inauthentic products or copyright or infringing on any copyrights by creating new listings for that brand that aren't connected to brand registry. Oh, this is a great question from Nikki. Thoughts on buying items from those wholesale telegram groups? They seem kind of sus, but sometimes have good products. Yeah, so I don't really fuck with the wholesale telegram groups only because it's just, it's too fast paced. It's too, it's like, if you don't jump on, you literally need to be sitting at your cell phone because they'll send an offer out to whatever hundred people in the group. And it's like, I got a hundred units of this and it's 1099. It's a take all and like you miss it. And then, boom, you know, by the time you research it, send the message, they're like, it's already gone. So you spend a lot of time communicating and not really moving the needle. Um, Something else to consider is before you ever place an order, with either a broker or one of these Telegram or WhatsApp distributors, you got to know how much inventory they have in stock, right? Because, yeah, it might be a great deal, but if they have 50,000 units and the Amazon listing is only selling 3,000 units a month, they essentially have, you know, a year's worth of inventory, over a year's worth of inventory. So they're going to sell it to you. They're going to sell it to six other Amazon sellers and then six more Amazon sellers. And in three or four weeks, the listing price is going to tank because the supply is too excessive for the demand. And when supply is too high and demand is low, there has to be an adjustment in the pricing to increase the demand to remove and deplenish some of the supply. It's basic economics. And no, virtual address would not work if your distributor is looking for a brick and mortar or warehouse address because they're going to Google it. They're going to Google it. Um, but for a warehouse, you could use a UPS box store because it's not technically a PO box. It's a business address. And I know people uh, like Jay Biz in our community and a bunch of other people, they've got multiple pallets shipped to um, UPS boxes by just having a simple conversation with the manager, letting them know, hey, well, once or twice a week, I'm going to get a two or three pallet shipment here and I'll come. You just call me immediately when it shows up or I'll get the notification from the vendor and I'll come pick it up same day. So it's out of your hair. All you got to do is receive it and keep it here for a little bit. Something else you could do if you don't have a warehouse is you could partner with local companies. So if you got any friends with warehouses, you got any local businesses, uh, you just simply walk in and throw an offer on the table. Hey, I'm a local business. I live right down the street. I'd love to invite you by my, my facility. Um, check out our offices. Unfortunately, right now I don't have a warehouse space. I was wondering if I'd potentially ship some products to your warehouse. I'll give you X amount of dollars per shipment or per pallet received. So Sarah asked, some of my suppliers are asking for a physical store. 
What's your thought on this? Should we have to buy it for rent if we're not living in the U.S.? No, you don't want to go buying a store, especially if you're in the beginning stages of your business. Like you want to go make an additional financial investment into a brick and mortar store to open an additional wholesale account. Um, so usually what we like to do with those companies that uh, require brick and mortar is we try to pitch to them you know, that we are looking to spend a fair chunk of money with them, right? And we are in the business of building lifelong relationships with the brands and the wholesalers that we partner with, right? So this isn't a one-off, one-and-done relationship. Like, I would ask them to consider looking over the fact that I do not have a storefront and give us a, give us a try. Give me six months to prove myself. I guarantee I'll increase your revenue and your bottom line. Just give me an opportunity, Right, you got to sell yourself. Uh, Jacob just asked, would you buy from wholesalers who provide Amazon ASIN? Same thing. You know, you got to make sure how much uh, inventory they have, because if they have a lot of inventory, you're going to be one of a couple dozen sellers who are going to buy them. So it's the same way these these OA and, and RA lead lists work. Right. You get a lead list. It comes out of the first of the month or the 15th of the month. Right. And. It's profitable for a week, two weeks, and then all of a sudden everybody's stock gets in and now it's no longer profitable because you're competing with 40 sellers who all got the same lead list and paid the same person for the same products and now they're all complaining because they're not making any money. We have purchased from suppliers who provide ASINs in catalogs and we just haven't had great experience with them. Thoughts on wholesale through a prep center? I like it. Uh, we got some people in our community doing pretty big numbers. You know, we got someone who just joined Inner Circle who doesn't have a prep center or doesn't have a warehouse, only uses prep center. Dude's doing 30 plus million dollars a year. Never packaged a product himself, only uses prep centers. So absolutely. How do you feel about shipping directly to Amazon? Like from your vendor? I mean, I feel okay about it. Just keep in mind that I prefer to have my products prepped before being sent to Amazon because Amazon's prep services typically take a little while, right? So... Typical time, especially at busier times of the season, like Q4, you're talking 10 to 15 to 18 days to prep your products. Uh, yeah, so ChatGPT I found is trash for finding distributors. Um, that's just my personal experience. Spent a couple hours um, really leveraging ChatGPT for a lot of my Amazon business. I mostly use it for email creation as well as uh, responses um to customer complaints and any inquiries about products uh, but as far as finding suppliers if you were to go to a search right now and say search for amazon wholesale suppliers uh only about five percent of the results would even be worth digging into and those would probably still be trash how do we move on sellable returns flea markets donations and sell them to our employees you can also use facebook marketplace you could just sell full pallets Right. Because the way I see it is even if I got two thousand dollars of value of cost of goods on a pallet sitting in my warehouse, I'd rather sell it for eight hundred bucks. It's not making me any money collecting dust in my warehouse. Doesn't matter that it's two thousand dollars. It's zero because it's not doing anything. It's not working for me. At least if I could get rid of it, even at 40 percent cost of goods, get eight hundred back. I could take that eight hundred, flip it into more inventory. Uh, so prep facilities, I know we have a list in our private Facebook group of every prep center in the U.S. Um, and honestly, I would just start Googling them. I, I really I feel it's best when you're opening prep center accounts to 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 preferably have a conversation with someone who's used that prep center before. Only because being in the industry for so long, I've heard nightmare experiences with prep centers. Um, so if you can get an insider tip about a specific prep center or whether you should use it or not use it, that's always more valuable than just a simple Google search. Uh, yeah, definitely want to be using a domain email when reaching out to suppliers. Yeah, your Gmail is definitely unprofessional. You know, like hotgirl420 at gmail.com is not the email you want to be sending suppliers. What's the biggest tip to get from 150K to 500K revenue? Obviously, the biggest tip is join any of our programs, eSellers or I, Inner Circle. They're all substantial to get you there. 
Um, and the second tip is all about your infrastructure. You know, the difference between operating a million dollar a month business and a six million, I mean, a million dollar a year business and a six million dollar a year business is all about your systems and your infrastructure. Cutting costs on prep, being more efficient with your buying, ensuring that you're meeting your minimum profit requirements, understanding your production cost per ASIN. The difference between a million dollar a year business and a six million dollar a year business is all aggregation of data and understanding your numbers and your systems and building out infrastructure and hiring teams to take over the day to day so you can free up your time and concentrate on the things that are going to grow the business instead of working on the day to day in the business. You should be at 75 cents to $1.50, Nikki, for prep costs. Uh, probably actually lower if you're doing 5,000 units a month. You could probably even get that negotiated lower. It's it's uh, it depends on the pack sizes and the prep requirements of your products. Though, if you're selling a lot of one packs, you can definitely get that, you know, forty to sixty cents, no problem. But if you got a lot of prep, you know, bubble wrap, poly bagging, taping, um, then your fees are going to be substantially higher. Tobias, what's up? Thank you for the value you create for the community. So glad I joined D Sellers Rye. I can recommend it to everyone who wants to take the next step with FBA. Stay lit. Also, Tobias, appreciate you, man. Sonny asks a quick question, which I think is an important question for managing expiration dates. How do you keep track of products with expiration dates? Any softwares? Um, so we haven't found softwares that integrate with Amazon to track expirations. I've had many calls with Amazon's consumable category team um, to try to get them to implement some sort of first in, first out uh, expiration model into their Amazon fulfillment centers. And obviously, I'm just one little guy with a little tiny business in Amazon's big, big world. So uh, we haven't gotten very far with that. But so what we do is we have a Google Sheet. And what it does is when we put in a shipment, it pulls that data to the Google Sheet and it pulls the BOL number, right, which is your bill of lading, the bowl number, essentially the name that you call your shipment, right? It has that. It has the merchant SKU. It has the quantity that was shipped. And then it has the expiration date, right? So let's say after 30 days, you have this Google sheet and now it has a thousand products in it because over the course of 30 days, you sent a thousand different SKUs to Amazon and they have all their different expirations. You'd simply sort by expiration soonest to latest, right? So you'll have the soonest expiring products first in that sheet. And then simply you go through that sheet. Zach, what's up, brother? I was just talking about you, man. I seen you fucking crushing it over there. So you guys are top 100 sellers right now, which is super exciting. And uh, yeah, it just says a lot about really the tenacity of people like you guys, you know, and your willingness to invest in yourself because you joined Inner Circle last year, business like 3X, you guys are continuing to grow. And uh, I'm just really proud of what you guys are doing. It's it's really fucking cool, guys. So I'm um, still my best to Ethan as well. Um, and I got off top there. I got a little excited. Oh, track profits. So then, uh, I mean, track uh, expiration dates. So then you simply sort that Excel file um, or Google sheet, which your team will have access to. You sort it by soonest expiring products, and then you start repricing them accordingly. Yeah, and that's where the issue comes in. So to elaborate on the expirations, it's really when um, you're replenishing, right? Because unless you let that item sell out, so what you could do is toggle two SKUs for your expiring products, right? That's really the best way to navigate it is toggling two SKUs. So like when you only got a couple days of inventory left on the one SKU, you'll send the other SKU in. So that other SKU completely sells out, new SKU goes into stock, brand new expiration, because all it takes, and this has happened to me, uh, about two months ago, I sent 6,000 items to Amazon for one of our best selling items. It's about a, a month, maybe 30, 35 days worth of inventory, right? And because it's a, it's a roll the 2D transparency, so you're not allowed to have two SKUs. So managing expiration dates becomes even more crucial and important when doing this, right? So I sent them in, and whatever happened, Amazon took an item that was from the previous shipment, put it back into inventory, and they marked ne nearly 3,600 items expired, right? Now, because it's an expiration dated product that created a case with Amazon, Amazon took entirely too long to respond to the case. Um, the units ended up expiring in Amazon, right? And the cost of the item uh, was to remove it or dispose of it was about $4 a unit. So you're talking about a $12,000 loss. 
uh, all because of Amazon expiration date. So it is crucial to manage your expirations. Uh, so we use HubSpot, but HubSpot's done exp dumb expensive. I'm talking, we're probably paying $40,000 a year for HubSpot for our CRM. I recommend definitely less expensive ones like uh, Asana is good, Trello. Um, these are all potential CRMs you could use. Yeah, FBM. For us, it's not worth the hassle, but for some people it is, especially if you're new, right? Because let's say you go, let's say you only got a thousand bucks, like some of the people shared about in this group already in this call. Right, let's say you only got a thousand bucks, right? You could literally go to Walmart today, shop their shop their discount aisle, and you can list something in the store and take it home, and it could be already sold in an hour by the time you get home, and you could ship it out that same day, right? So there's a lot of value to be provided when you're smaller with FBM because it gives you a quick turnaround on your cash. You could literally sell the product tonight, you know, and you just bought it a couple hours ago. Like there's a huge value in that. It helps you turn cash flow quicker, and grow sales, grow revenue. Well, when we have a limited budget, do we buy those products that we are already selling or do we buy new products from new suppliers from which we just received permission building new relationships? I do not have a direct answer for this because unfortunately it's both, right? You, you In order to drive revenue for your current operation, you need to continue to reorder the products that are selling and in order to scale revenue for future growth, you need to continue to harvest new relationships. So it's a double-sided sword. You can't do one without the other, right? Because if you're just focusing on replenishing items, your business is going to begin to grow a little and then it will stagnate, right? It will stay stagnant. So you can't do that, right? You got to be doing both. You got to continue to replenish to drive sales and continue to open new accounts to drive future growth for your business. Eric, I sent in 4,000 units of makeup products last month and sold out. I replanted another 4,000 units, and Amazon is not giving me the buy box at all. Gone from 300 sales a day to 20. Um, so, Charlie, what I would imagine is there was probably something that happened to the ranking of that product. So the first thing you want to do is pop into that listing and make sure that either the main category or the subcategory did not change. You'll be able to see that change in Keepa. Usually a substantial drop from 300 sales a day to 20 sales a day is a direct indication of a category change or some sort of pertinent information, whether it be bullet points, images, or title was changed. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go to those previous orders, analyze. If you go to your orders tab, you'll be able to see the, the original listing title for those past orders. First, analyze the listing title, make sure nothing changed, check the category, make sure nothing changed. If any of those things have changed, go into the listing and attempt to fix them, right? Now, you need to look for other reasons. If that's not the reason why you think the BSR has gone up so high, you need to look for other reasons why the BSR has gone up so high. So first step would be, for the second stage of this process, is typing the UPC in Google. Right. Potentially, Amazon has suppressed the buy box because there's another online marketplace selling the same product for less than it's listed on Amazon. So what Amazon will do in that case is suppress the buy box. So you cannot um, sell as much as you used to. And the third thing to do would be to click on the edit listing tab in Seller Central and see if there's any pertinent data missing in the listing, because that's another reason why Amazon may suppress the buy box. Sometimes it's missing pack size, sometimes it's missing ingredients, sometimes it's missing nutritional facts, and whatever's missing will be circled in, red, in a red box on your edit listing tab, and you can instantly update it, All right? And then, you know, you figure, so you got about 10 months of inventory and that's assuming you're getting all 20 sales a day, which you're probably not. So you got over a year's worth of inventory. Uh, what I would suggest is similar to what I discussed earlier and how to bump yourself into the buy box um, and, and, and increase sales would be running some coupons, right? Coupons definitely help increase sales. You know, we had coupons to probably 10 to 15% or uh, PPC as well, PPC and coupons. You know, because you need to get customers back to the page. And the only way to get customers back to the page, because it sounds like they're diminishing, is to drive traffic to that listing. I'm starting. How can I know what brands I have to engage? So it's very simple. You would create what's called a test SKU. You'd simply go to add a product in Seller Central. You'd add that ASIN to your inventory. And when you follow the prompts 
before you're able to complete this step, it will let you know if you need to submit any invoicing for ungating or approval for that specific category. So before you ever buy anything to sell on Amazon, we always suggest creating a test listing to make sure you're approved. Because what I see people do is they'll scan something at, let's say Costco or BJ's, it will say they're not approved and they won't purchase it. When really all they had to do was click approve to sell and they get an auto ungate. Right. So there's a lot of missed opportunities to do that. Yeah, David. So for improving IPI, one, it's I would say your sell through. You know, you definitely want to make sure you have a, a selfie, uh, a selfie. You want to make sure you have a healthy sell through rate. Um, and also you want to make sure your account, your account health is on point. Right. Because account health plays a super important role. So typically our our guidelines for account health are, you know, 48 hours. If there's an account health issue. Well, really 24, 48 the max. If there's an account health issue, we would prefer to have it addressed within 24 hours immediately. Amazon loves that shit. Yeah, so in stock is, is nearly impossible for wholesale businesses to manage because you, you just get so much turn on your inventory. Like our in stock rate is terrible. Um, and then stranded inventory. You want to make sure you're managing your stranded inventory. Any stranded inventory that's been in there for multiple months, just pull it back. Right. If you haven't found a solution for it and you can't get the listing fixed to where it's unstranded, it's it's clogging up your IPI. It's a, it's not allowing you to grow your IPI and it's also charging you storage fees every month. So, like, just dump it. Right. Dispose of it. Pull it back to your warehouse. Send it out as a different pack size. Um, you got to get rid of it and then improve your sell through. Right. A, a very healthy Amazon wholesale sell through is about 30 days, which is about 12 turns a year. And a great place to see your sell through is simply going to inventory, inventory planning. And then in the top right, it says it has your sell through. Um, and right now, ours is not where I'd like it to be. So I'm actually going to be bringing this up to my team on Monday because it dropped about 12 days in the past two weeks. So we're at like eight turns instead of our normal 10 and a half. Yeah, I've heard of Smart Scout. Smart Scout's great for finding, uh, for finding brand exclusive relationships. Yes, that's a great way around navigating brand relationships is simply calling the brand. And instead of trying to open a direct account with the brand, ask them who their wholesalers and distributors are. 100%. We, we like to go about that method at trade shows too. So do you have any research as people are looking for new potential brands or products? I've never, I've never actually hired a specific position to do that. We've always upgraded current positions to do that, right? Because I feel like before someone really starts connecting with brands and wholesalers, they should kind of understand what goes on in the day-to-day -day at your business operations. I think it will, it will give them a lot of knowledge and information and allow them to answer the questions that the wholesaler is asking accurately so you can build trust in the relationship. So I've never hired someone off the street to find brands. I've only upgraded current employees to find brands. And usually they'll start as buyers. So they start buying inventory, understanding the process. And then we let them know, hey, if you bring any new distributors or brands on, you'll get a bonus for not only will you be able to manage the account and get commissions off the profit you make, but if we are still doing business with them in 90 days and we've made over $5,000 in profit, we'll give you a $500 bonus on top of that as well, right? So it allows them and incentivizes them to continue to be on the lookout for new companies because not only do they get the cash bonus if we do consistent business with them, but then they will get a commission base as well for all of the profits that they bring in for that specific company. Um, how do you add private label to your wholesale business? Let me, let me say this before I go into this. So there's two ways to do this. You can simply add, what we did was add private label to our current wholesale account. One, because when we initially do it, we didn't really understand about the value of being able to build equity in a private label business and sell it later down the road. Um, so all of our business is all on one account, right? But if you really plan, if you're just trying to build a small little private label brand to get some experience, Right. And you don't really have any goals of building it to multi, multi million dollars Then do it on the same account. Right. You're going to get your customer feedback, your seller feedback. Like you're going to get some account um, applause because you have experience and history on Amazon. But if you plan on selling this brand, MM, I would advise you to create an entirely new Amazon account, because when someone goes to purchase your Amazon company, they're going to want the whole package. Right. They're going to want 
your manufacturer, they're going to want your Amazon account, they're going to want the data as well as any customer emails that you've acquired over the years. So um, if you're going to do it either way, first you need to find the product that you'd like to manufacture, and then you need to get a sample of that product, and then you'd simply be shipping that product into the country that you're going to be selling it in and having the listing ready, fully optimized, great images, SEO, bullet points, and nutritional facts, weights, dimensions, the whole nine. But I advise, only because I've seen people do it all the time, they get into private label first, and they take their whole bag and they blow it on their first product. It doesn't take off. And then they get very defeated and they quit Amazon. So that's why I always encourage people to start selling on Amazon first. Um, gain some experience. It will allow you to understand the way Amazon works. It will allow you to understand the data, the fees that Amazon charges. It will allow you to understand consumer behaviors and habits. And it will allow you to create a much more substantial and value-packed product that can provide the consumer exactly what they're looking for, opposed to you just throwing shit at the wall and hoping that it sticks because you're brand new to this game. You know, and obviously I always encourage investing in knowledge and information because it's the fast track to success. It's the cheat code. All right, my friends. Well, it's been an honor and a privilege. I love spending my Sundays with y'all. Trying to think if there's any questions I missed. I do not think so. So y'all have a beautiful rest of your day. I'm about to head over to the warehouse. And it's a rickety wrap, my friends. So have a beautiful day, stay grateful, and stay lit. Adios, and also check out the other videos right here on YouTube. It's jam-packed with the info. Stay lit.